Escazú is for you. We really wanted to have this chat series to break the agreement down and make it real for people. So it was something that people could connect with and understand. Sometimes these international and regional agreements can seem very far away and not relevant to us. Escazú is for you is brought to you by the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute or Canari and funded by the European Union under Canari's Pisces project, which the EU is supporting. An adaptation of a live online chat series of the same name hosted by Canari in November 2020, Eskazoo is for You is a four-part limited edition podcast created to shed light on and draw the public's attention to the regional agreement on access to information, public participation, and justice in environmental matters in Latin America and the Caribbean, also known as the Eskazoo Agreement. Eskazoo is for You is hosted by Canari Executive Director and Trinidad and Tobago Eskazoo Champion Nicole Liotto. Every part or episode of the series tackles a different yet equally critical aspect of the treaty and how it will impact upon Caribbean citizens' lives. For each chat, Nicole is joined by one or more of her colleagues and fellow Eskazoo champions from throughout the Caribbean. On this episode, of Eskazoo is for you. You know, long gone are the days where you have the technocrats just coming up with the ideas and pushing it down our throats. But we're in an age now where you have to liaise with the people and not just those who are supposedly educated, but you have to bring it to all sectors of society. You know, as you mentioned, the most vulnerable, the marginalized, everybody has um, that level of knowledge, local knowledge. And so it's really important that you, you infuse their knowledge into ensuring that we meet the Sustainable Development Goals. Episode number two, public participation. I am Nicole Liotto, Executive Director of the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, or Canari. With us today, Arika Hill, Executive Director of the Environmental Awareness Group, or EAG, in Antigua and Barbuda, and Coretta Charles from the St. Lucia National Trust. And Coretta is also one of the Escazoo representatives of the public. So I'm welcome again. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Right. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you for the invitation by Canari. My name is Arika Hill. I I'm the executive director of the Environmental Awareness Group in Antigua and Barbuda. Um, we are really very much focused on Antigua. We don't do much work in Barbuda, unfortunately. The EAG is a non-governmental organization and within around the past 30 years, we really started off as a grassroots activist group um, that was really very focused on, well, just environmental awareness in Antigua and Barbuda. And um, that has that has ballooned quite a bit into a lot of work on species management. So our focus has been for the past 25 years really on the rehabilitation of offshore islands so that our endemic and endangered species can thrive. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Nicole. Um, I'm Coretta, as you said, and I've been with the National Trust for a little over 11 years. And we basically are a membership organization with a mandate to help conserve and preserve St. Lucia's natural and built heritage. So we do quite a bit in both areas. Um, we developed recently the Walcott Place, which is not environmental, but it has to do with preserving the heritage of um, Sir Derek Walcott and his brother, his twin brother, um, Roderick Walcott. We do um, conservation of offshore islands, um, monitoring these islands to ensure that invasive species are are kept out and that you have the local species thriving. We take care of various sites. For example, where I am right now at Pigeon Island National Landmark, that's our flagship site, even though we're getting a beating due to COVID, but we still maintain this site, which is historic as well as um, an you know, environmental site. We do a lot of school visits. We engage the communities. We do everything environmental, you know, and just try to get persons involved in why it's important to take care of their heritage so that it's not only for our benefit, but also for future generations. So that's in a nutshell what we do at the National Trust. We've been around for 45 years. We celebrated our 45th anniversary on September 26th. So we have quite a bit under our belt.
you. So two powerful ladies with us and two are really of the leading civil society organizations in the region and certainly in, in, in their countries. Um, long track records of experience that you're bringing to this discussion. So this chat today focuses on one element of the Escazoo Agreement, this regional treaty, all about public participation in environmental decision making. So the Escazoo Agreement, I've put the link um, to the official website where the actual um, document can be downloaded and lots of good information. It's a regional environmental treaty, the first one in the Latin American Caribbean region um, and the first one in the world to protect environmental defenders. And it's all about putting people at the center of environmental management. It focuses really on three things. One, access to information. Two, public participation in environmental decision making. And three, access to justice in environmental matters. So this agreement really recognizes that all of us have the right to healthy environment and therefore these three things are very important to allow us to exercise those, those rights. The agreement has already been signed by 24 countries and officially ratified by nine um, it needs 11 countries to ratify it before it can come into force. Um, we have two countries on track to officially ratify, so we're expecting this announcement um, imminently that any time this week, the 90-day the, the period between the 11th ratification, um, in 90 days after that, the agreement will come into force. So really, we're looking at into December, January, February. Um, by February next year, we should be having some very exciting news with this agreement coming into force. Um, there's a second meeting of the signatories to the agreement. Remember, 24 have signed already, taken that first level of commitment. Um, they are meeting December 9th to 10th. So this chat series is really leading up to that and trying to build public awareness, understanding, and of course, calling for, for governments to... to make the final commitment and, and ratify or accede to the treaty. Um, so from the Caribbean side, which are the countries that, that have signed and, and ratified? Tremendous leadership in countries which have ratified Antigua and Barbuda, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Guyana, which was the first country to ratify this agreement and really make that high level of commitment. Many other countries have taken that first step of signing to say, yes, we're interested. We're not fully committed yet. It's a two-step process. Um, and those countries include Dominica, Grenada, Haiti, Jamaica, St. Lucia, Belize, and that's it. So out of the Caribbean, really, most of the countries have already signaled some commitment. The Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, and Suriname have yet to either sign or, or fully accede. So we're at different stages in the Caribbean, and we're really calling on governments to make this commitment, to show to citizens your commitment to good governance, to public participation, access to information, and access to justice. The, the agreement recognizes the public's right to participate in environmental decision-making and seeks to ensure that that right can be expressed. Governments who, who sign on to this agreement are committing to open and inclusive participation on decisions that have or may have a significant impact on the environment, including when they may affect human health. So this decisions could be anything from permits for development Development, land use planning, policies, plans, rules, regulations. So all kinds of decisions affecting the environment, we need to see open and inclusive participation. The agreement also has some specific things. It talks about participation needed to, needing to be early on in the process and giving people sufficient time frame to be able to participate. For example, giving them access to information early enough that they can study the information and input. Um, it talks about giving due consideration to public observation. Observations is not my favorite word. Um, I have to tell you up front, maybe we can talk about it more, Coretta, but um, this public input being in the form of public observations, which um, the governments would then consider in making their decisions and would feed back to the public on how those observations have been considered, whatever the decision is, you know. Um, it talks about providing appropriate spaces for consultation, regard for local knowledge, especially supporting vulnerable stakeholders and supporting those who are going to be most affected to engage, respecting the rights of Indigenous people and local communities. So lots of interesting things there in the agreement, which of course will be unpacked much further when it is implemented. Let's dive into really talking about this in a practical sense, you know, what would 
would this mean for us in the, in the Caribbean? So the first question I have for both of you, I'll go to Coretta first. Um, you know, why, why would you say public participation in, in environmental decision making is important for sustainable development in the first place? Why should this be something that we support. Okay, thanks, um, Nicole. It's extremely important because when you think of sustainable development, um, you're thinking of inclusion. Um, there is no way you can address the issues that affect people without having their voices on it. So um, that is the major reason why it's important. You have to put people at the center. We long are, you know, long gone are the days where you have the technocrats just coming up with the ideas and pushing it down our throats. But we're in a an age now where you have to liaise with the people and not just those who are supposedly educated, but you have to bring it to all sectors of society. You know, as you mentioned, the most vulnerable, the marginalized, everybody has um, that level of knowledge, you know, um, local knowledge. And so it's really important um, that you, you infuse their knowledge into um, ensuring that we meet the sustainable development goals. So the idea of bringing local knowledge, enriching the, the, the decisions as well. That yes. is fantastic. Um, uh, Arika, what are, you, what, what are your thoughts on this? Why is this important? I love Coretta's word of infuse. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that just resonates with me, especially because I think that we've seen over the years how important it has been for the voices of people to be a part of something. You know, like you want people to buy into the environment. Like, and that seems to be a lot about, you know, how we have gone ab about things. When you think about the Paris Agreement, you think about all of, even the sustainable development goals, it's this whole concept of buy-in. You can't expect people to buy in if they're not involved. You can't expect them to run with your cause if you only tell them about it at the end when you've already done everything that you're now saying, okay, yes, I really want you to champion this at your home. So, but why would I do that? You haven't involved me in your planning process. You haven't involved me in your implementation. Now at the very end, you're kind of saying, yeah, 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 join in. That doesn't work. We know it doesn't work because we don't like it when people do it to us. So I think um, that the Eskazu agreement in itself is, it's just a very common sense agreement because it really says, I want to involve you from way back <laughs> all the way to, to the end. I think that's really the importance of it. Mm -hmm. and, and that point of early involvement in the conceptualization, in the, in the form mission of the idea and the planning yeah not at the end when the decision has been made um and it's very token yeah building that yeah. buy-in and of course you know an, another angle just to add is this idea of rights people have a right um you know a lot of these resources are shared resources a public space the air we breathe is shared it is shared you know our ocean is shared so you know we all have a right some people don't have a right to benefit and others do um so really engaging everybody you know bringing the, the local knowledge bringing the ideas the energy together building buy-in but respecting everyone's right to be around the table um you know is so powerful and and so central and, and the sustainable um development goals have leave no one behind you know as a central banner and nothing speaks to that more to me than than engaging people in the process and, and in the decision that's so great you know so then this is a broad framework yes it's important so then let's let's talk about some specific experiences you all have had um you know um two very well respected uh, organizations done doing a lot of work in St. Lucia and, and Antigua. Do you have some practical cases and examples that you can share with us of where the public participated in decision making um, about an, in, in environmental issues? This time I'll go to Arika first. And, and any ex experiences you want to share? And, and I'm smiling because I wish I had um, stories of where the public was engaged mm -hmm. and it worked out. Mm -hmm. That is not, unfortunately, a huge part of our environmental history in Antigua and Barbuda. So one story, when I was preparing for this, one story that I think about um, whenever I think about a, a situation that could have gone a bit better um, is one where in a community, which is Jolly, Harbor, um, well, it's the community of Bolands and so on, but they, it was this decision to build a marina in a wetland. And beyond all of the political discussions about it, because I think 
think, again, sometimes people get confused. They think about the politics as opposed to just this is the issue. Now, it's a, it was a thriving wetland. Um, so mangrove ecosystems and people were able to fish and live there. They were able to not be flooded when it rained. All right. So for me, that's a huge part. No flooding. Anyway, it was decided that, you know, this developer was going to come in. They were going to put in this marina. It was going to bring in millions of dollars into Antigua and Barbuda. It was the best idea possible. All right. Fantastic. So we built in the marina. People are getting jobs, you know, you know the usual. Um, and I, I often, I often question, by the way, the jobs, because I always kind of look at the jobs and I'm like, is this the highest level that you could have hired Antigans at? At any rate, moving on past that. If a gentle drizzle comes in that area, Jolly Harbor doesn't flood. The communities that surround it do. So the very people who were um, initially saying to the government, look, hey, if you do this, we are going to be impacted. And they said, no, we're going to build it properly so that, you know, you'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Every single time it drizzles, West Palm Beach, which is the area very near to it, floods. Right now, Antigua is in flood, in a flood, um, flash flood warning. So, you know, we're seeing over 20 inches of rain in one day, which is the first. That area was completely flooded out yesterday. Completely flooded out the day before. I mean, you're seeing loss of light, not livestock, literally seeing livestock flowing through wetlands. I mean, that's disturbing in itself. You're seeing people's homes completely destroyed. This is, and yes, this is an extreme event. So we're not saying, I'm in no way saying that this was the expectation, but we are saying that if it was built better and if if there was better interaction with the communities and better discussion with those people, perhaps it wouldn't have been so bad. We have another case study which is emerging um, in another community where we, it is within a marine protected area. There's a development by a Chinese developer who's come in and the first thing that they did was rip out huge areas of, of mangrove. And uh, of mangrove ecosystem. And I want to say ecosystem and not just the plants because it, it destroys everything. It's not just a tree that's a problem, right? So you're going to have a definite impact upon the ecosystem itself. You're going to see impacts on the seagrass beds and on the coral reef ecosystem as well. So you would think having already had the experience of Jolly Harbor, having already agreed to um, this Paris Agreement, having national policy that speaks to the need to engage with people that, you know, that would have happened, right? You'd think so, wouldn't you? No, that didn't happen. That, that development started in 2016 and it is now 2020 and we are still waiting for there to be any stakeholder engagement whatsoever by the developer, despite the fact that it is called for by law. Now, we don't know what the impact of the Yida development is going to be. We don't know as yet. Be we expect it's going to be pretty bad. I mean, there's hope for or plans for a deep water harbor there. And I mean, a deep water harbor in that area is going to be, is going to devastate the marine ecosystem that exists. But I believe that if people were engaged at the beginning, that Nobody is saying don't develop, but if people were engaged, it would be wiser development. It would be development that responds natural to the natural environment where people and the natural environment can live in harmony. And I think that is where we would like to see things happen, but unfortunately that is not the case in Antigua and Barbuda. So, but but I, I like your statement on, you know, it's not about anti-development, it's about wise development with people's input. Consistently. Um, and I yeah. think, you know, when when people see that, um, that when they are able to discuss with you, like they're able to say, hey, these are my concerns and those concerns. Erica, you're slipping out a bit and I know that your internet is um, not too stable because you're experiencing some heavy weather in, in Antigua. Um, Coretta, what about you in, in the St. Lucia context? Do you have similar stories or different stories about public participating in environmental decision making? Yes, in, yes indeed, Nicole. I think you know that, <laughs> hence the question. Boy, there are so many cases, but I could probably give two that comes to mind. There is a DSH project or Desert Star Holding. Again, I believe um, might have been Chinese coming in. And one of the, the first things they wanted to do, like in Antigua and Barbuda, was 
um, remove a part of the Mankote mangroves. That's one of our richest mangroves in St. Lucia. And so it, I think they had dubbed the project Little Miami or something like that. They had really grand ideas and they even wanted to build a, a causeway connecting the mainland to um, two of our offshore islands in Beaufort, which are Maria Major and Maria Minor. And on Maria Major, you could find the Whiptail Lizard and the St. Lucia Racer, which are both endemic to St. Lucia, and the Racer is the world um, known rarest snake. And so we tried time and time again to meet with the developers. Um, the former administration had met with us, and they told the developers that they need to meet with the National Trust before doing any such work. However, we follow through, try to get the meetings, and to date, nothing. Um, and when we've asked the current government, you know, or explained to them the importance of hearing from the trust as it pertains to the mangroves and connecting the, the, the road, it was horrible. Um, this played out practically in the media. They did not sit with us at all. They did not allow us to participate in any decisions. Um, but the good thing is, I think because of our advocacy on it, um, they took off the mangroves off the table. Um, I'm hoping it does not get reintroduced and also talks about connecting the mainland to the offshore islands have also been um, taken off the table. And that's because the trust method, um, we always try to speak to the developers and the government first. That's always our strategy. Sometimes it may appear to the public that we are quiet and not saying anything, but it's called doing your research, trying to reach out first before you put anything out. And in the event where they're not responsive, then we're gonna put it out to the media so that everybody could become aware of it. And so I think um, that that article, an article was carried in um, The Guardian, if I'm not mistaken, about the, this development and they got some bad publicity, which is not really our, our intention. But if you refuse to listen to us, if you refuse to give us a seat at the table, we have to call on you know, support from outside of St. Lucia internally, it doesn't matter to get our point across because as Arika said, it's not just bush because people look at the mangroves as just bush, but really and truly when you have a healthy mangrove ecosystem, you are preventing um, flooding from occurring, you know, in these areas. You are supporting your fisher folks because you know the tiny fish will go there to grow and thrive. So it's not just the bush or the mangrove we're, we're, we're protecting. We're protecting our livelihoods, the people who rely on those areas for their livelihoods. So that one, that's one of the projects that come to mind. And another one is um, Prale. I think it's called La Parody. If you've been to St. Lucia and you drive down that side, you see a monstrosity of a building or a hotel that had started years ago and they have not been able to complete it. And I was told, because this happened before I joined the trust, so in my little research, I was told that initially there was no communication with the, the, the developers nor the um, government. But then after we, you know, kept at it, they allowed us in, you know, gave us a seat at the table and we met very frequently with the developers and the government and we even had community meetings about three and we invited the developers to make presentations on this and they indeed um, listened to some of our recommendations and put in silt traps and so on but the thing is whilst all of that was happening permission was already granted for other things to start and therein lies the problem you cannot be engaging with the stakeholders and and um, as you said you know getting observations I don't like that word either Nicole that word, yeah. That's a very powerful word. To at least in detail and find out what the issues are before any sort of, of movement is made. Otherwise, you run the risk of losing things and there's no way you can replace it because as a result of the, the, the parody development, we had our white-breasted thrasher, that's the bird, um, I think it's endemic to St. Lucia, that was affected. A lot of them died. Um, I think the Federland snake as well, which is endemic to St. Lucia, they too were affected because of that project. You had damage to the coral reef and the list continues. So those are the two cases I could give you examples of. That's, that's three really good cases of where, you know, your civil society organizations were trying to represent, you know, a few things. One being local livelihoods and the interests of the local communities. Um, and also the importance of the ecosystem goods and services for the well-being of the, the wider citizenry you know, and having that long-term perspective. Um, exactly. Yeah, and, and, you know, good stories of the importance of having that voice at the table, 
when that voice is not being heard, you know, maybe the public, you know, citizens, stakeholders go to, to other avenues like the media. Yes. Um, but, but not being token. This, this don't talk to us while already going ahead with the decision. Exactly. Key, very yeah. key. Yeah. Um, and we are going to want to talk more about this. But I think, you know, um, Arika referenced that, that, you know, this, this missed opportunity, I would say, of, of having the de de developments in Antigua engage the, the public very deeply, despite the presence of the legislative and, and policy framework. So, you know, what, what do you think would be the difference if we have Escazú? Antigua and Barbuda has ratified, has really made a strong commitment, and St. Lucia has, has taken the first step, is on that path. You know, so what do both of you, um, if I... I Arika, we might have lost, I'm not sure. Um, so I'll ask you here. first. Oh, you're here, great. So Arika, what do you think, you know, will, will be the difference with Escazú agreement? What, what difference is, is that going to make in, in, in a practical sense? Okay, so there are a few things that I thought of, and one of them is having legal recourse. I think, um, you know, as I mentioned in the previous case study, the whole idea of people feeling like, what's the point? What else can I do? I've, I've already spoken to my ministers. I've spoken to the technocrats. I've, you know, we've, we have done kind of like Coretta. We've reached out to international news media. You're at the point of what else can I do? Now you have legal recourse. I think that is such a key thing. I can, as a citizen, not just as an agency, because I think sometimes we, especially in Antigua, we immediately go and think, okay, EAG, you go deal with it. But it's not just the environmental awareness group. It's me as a citizen, Arika Hill, I can do that. I can go to the law. I think it's also an opportunity for people to, for us as citizens to be able to identify how we are engaged. So in, in our legislation, in both in our Environmental Protection and Management Act, as well as in our Physical Planning Act, um, there there is like a, a note that says, you know, you have to engage with stakeholders. But I think that with the Escazú agreement, you can actually now be able to say, well, I don't, I don't want you just to have a town hall meeting. I want you to come to my house. I want you to um, come into my schools. I, I want to tell you how I want to be engaged. So I think that for me, I, and that's what I'm hoping to see in Antigua, that it's, we are the ones who decide how we, how we want you to come to us and how often we want you to come to us so that that meaningful engagement that people speak about is actually met. And I'm also hoping that from the Escazú agreement that we will feel that freedom to speak because we know that the, the Escazú agreement speaks a lot about the, the environmental defenders and the protections that are created for us. So people won't feel like I'm going to be victimized. Um, and if I am, there is recourse, you know, because the Escazú agreement speaks to that. So maybe, maybe we'll see more activism in, in the environment. We'll see people feeling free to not just kind of use their Twitter fingers and talk about it, but are also free to, in public, public spaces, say, hey, I don't like this and I'm expecting you to actually change it. But, I mean, that's amazing that you feel so empowered um, by this regional treaty and the fact that your government has made that commitment, you see as empowering and really validating and encouraging citizens to, to engage. Um, yes. That's wonderful. Coretta, do, do you have a similar perspective or, or something else? No, very similar, but just to add, I, I do agree with Erika in terms of legal recourse, because as I mentioned, you have these damage to the environment, which oftentimes, you, you know, they're not reversible. And so when you have um, legal ramifications, maybe the developers and the authorities that may be might think twice before breaking the law. So I think it would sort of, you know, help, help with that to some extent. Um, I think that is going to mean we could avoid conflicts more. That means a lot to us at the Trust, because it, it, it honestly, 
it hurts me when I have, because I'm the media and communication officer, right? And so I have to monitor our social media. I have to look at the comments on, based on articles and the personal attacks against the staff, myself included, the director, um, against the organization, because we are basically speaking up or advocating for the, the protection of, of, of our environment, which is to benefit everybody. But then persons color us as being political or partisan and and it's honestly, it's, it's painful. So I'm hoping with this, it will take some time that um, we can have better protection for environmental defenders because that's what we are. You know, in Latin America, you have hundreds being killed annually. Fortunately, we do not have that in the Caribbean, but it does not mean we do not have persons who are threatened and victimized. And I think Escazú is going to help us in the Caribbean. And as Erika said, it's going to empower more people operative word more people because many persons right now are fearful of speaking out against anything they may have strong opinions behind closed door they might set up fake accounts on social media to tackle it we don't want that we want persons to be em empowered to speak up when something goes wrong and not just for their community but anywhere in the country because as you see with COVID, you know, it, it can affect you irrespective of where it originated from. Um, so apart from conflict, just access to information, Nicole, sometimes we're trying to get basic information and that information can help us to design our advocacy strategies or communication strategy. And you're calling the relevant authority and it's just like you're running against a wall. Nobody knows anything. And so that prevents us from working as effectively as we would like to. So I'm hoping with this agreement, there'll be you know, greater access to the information and um, we can use it to work smarter and more efficiently. Um, and just a, a seat at the table, Nicole, which is very important. In the case I mentioned about the DSH in Viewfort, sorry, I got distracted. In the case I mentioned about the DSH in Viewfort, I remember clearly that they, there was a public meeting, but how it was advertised, I don't think everybody would have gone because it looks almost like a political rally. You know, the colors that were being used, let's meet here to discuss this, that's perfectly fine. But you ought not to have any of the colors representing the parties as a part of that because those who are of an opposing view or you know, belonging to a separate party would not feel welcome to, to be a part of that. So we have to be mindful how we package things. And I'm hoping that Eskazu, you know, will be the guide for our um, leaders, you know, to not um, use me mechanisms like that to get a message across, but it has to be impartial and you know, there's no bias and we can hold them accountable. I like that. It, we certainly what's in the document now. You know, it's quite a short document, very readable. I encourage people to go on online and read it. Um, but we're expecting that that will then be implemented through guidelines, standards. There will be capacity building opportunities. So I mean, to me, this then what 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 I like about it as well as what you you both said is this idea of some kind of standard setting um, at the regional level. So it's not at the whim and fancy, you know, of of current players, but we all have some kind of standard and guidelines to operate by. Um, all, you know, focused on this being open, being inclusive, being transparent, um, meaningful engagement, as Arika said. Um, just yeah. Nicole, what you just yeah. said, it's, it's important, especially in our context where, unfortunately, every five years or every 10 years, based on, you know, whoever wins the election, you see things changing. They, they undo the progress that was made. And I like what you said. It's about raising standards because there are things in place already, but Eskazu is trying to improve the standards. So I'm hoping that this whole five-year cycle foolishness that currently, you know, is happening in our Caribbean countries, you know, will be stopped because you're a part of a, a higher, a regional agreement that will hold you to higher standards. And it would be rather embarrassing if you try to undo that. I don't think any of our governments would want that embarrassment. Yeah, yeah. so it is embarrassing and all the global agreements, you know, have have this enshrined as, as part of good governance, um, the rights of, of stakeholders to, to participate in decision making and, and have those, those decisions be transparent and have accountability. So this is just core best practice around the world um, in terms of good, good governance.
governance. And I'll share with both of you too. Um, Canary, of course, we work a lot in this area in trying to facilitate and, and promote stakeholder participation in environmental decision making. And Karate made me think we, we have a little exercise we do and we say this is, there's a line, you know, a, a participation line. At one end of the line is top down decision making, you know, I government are making the decision or I whoever and not telling anybody this not none of their business, right? Very top down. At the other end of the line, the other end of the spectrum is really shared decision making. And then there's a whole spectrum in between, you know, somewhere in the middle, stakeholders are consulted um, and, and their views taken into account to varying degrees. And we do an exercise asking, you know, people from different countries, people from government, civil society, mixed groups, where is your country um, and your sector along this line? And they put it and they explain why, you know, and we say in what direction is it moving? Are things getting better? Are things moving in a positive direction to be more participatory um, and good governance? Or And the scary thing is some of them feel that their country is going backwards. You know, I mean, I've, I've been doing this for 15 years with people and gotten all kind of different results from all different countries, all different sectors. And it's a very personal opinion. But that feeling that that our voice is being heard less and less and less is very frightening to me. And Arika, I'll, I'll go back to you. You know, your thing saying, you know, this is empowering. It's so important and pushing the region in the right direction um, is so important. Um, any comments well, Nicole, on that? I would actually, yeah. I would actually add to that. I mean, I, 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 can, I can definitely feel that sense of, you know, the where your participation is needed and how it is really involved in, you know, in, in real decision making. Because at the Environmental Awareness Group, we are very much involved in, um, so we sit on the technical advice advisory committee for the Department of Environment. So we are part of the policy making part of things. But I think it's where the question becomes then a little more difficult when it gets to the point of, okay, well, now that we're seeing the implementation of that policy, um, is it really happening how it should? But I would also add that even when we're thinking about um, how meaningful engagement begins, there's a core set of people that sometimes we don't necessarily engage with. And I, I know that it, I've seen it in Antigua. When I'm on Twitter and I'm looking at all of the young people who are like 35 and under, so they're out of university, so they're young, um, but they're not necessarily homeowners as yet. They're not, they still live at home with their parents. They don't have that, that, that quite that high level of autonomy. Those are the people who are not engaged. And they are the ones who have the most to say. And I feel like they are the ones who who are the least engaged in the conversation, but they want to be engaged and they, there has to be a way to meaningfully target them and meaningfully engage them because they're not, they're not sitting and watching it happen. They're really enraged most of the time by what they see in their country. And I think that they have a huge part to play. So, so I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll throw that back to you and going, going on to our last question, you know, what mechanisms do you think people... We we, we what do, what mechanisms do you think we need to strengthen in our countries to make this happen? So if you say this is an audience who's enraged, what do you think could be done to try and reach them and, and give them that space? And any ideas? So I'm gonna turn off my video again just because my internet is not the best. Um, so I believe that I want to spend the time to actually do a study. I don't want to just off the top of my head tell you, this is how they need to be engaged. I need to ask them, how do you want to be engaged? Do you want to be a part of the decision making process? And if you are a part of the decision making process, how are we going to do this together? Um, so I, I would actually spend the time to do that first, but I think that they need to be asked. Um, I also think that there is... So, you know, having legal representation is not as easy as, as we want to think it is. Um, it's not because we've tried at the EAG to go to, you know, to the legal profession and ask them to help us in different areas. And it's not a simple process. So I think that the legal fraternity definitely needs to be engaged very heavily and not just from, a, you know, a survey that's done, but really asking them how do they think that they can be a part of the decisions. That's a great answer. I'm sorry I also have, I'm in a flight <laughs> room. <laughs> um, no, it's okay, so we, think, we, we heard you well. You know, 
Yeah, I, I, I would really love to see how the legal fraternity is going to be engaged. Um, and so the last thing um, in terms of mechanisms that I was thinking about is I know that, for instance, the Department of Environment has a complaints mechanism. How many people are engaged in the development of that mechanism? How do people really do? Do Antiguans and Barbudans even know that they can access that? Do they know that when they make a complaint that it goes somewhere? And I say this because I, as the Environmental Awareness Group, have made complaints and I have seen the lackadaisical response to it. So I want to be able to see a, a system that's robust. That is not just, yes, we have a complaints mechanism and you can tick it off and say that you've done it, but that when people raise real questions and real concerns addressed respectfully and that it is addressed in such a way that I don't then have to go and make a stink and be that defender all the time who's Monica, we, we're losing you but I think some really powerful points you know one on really understanding who needs to be heavily engaged and, and developing tailored strategies for how we can effectively create spaces and, and give them that that room for, for them to, to engage. Um, second, you know, it's really about capacity building, but in particular, zoning in on the legal fraternity and how can they support the, the, this whole movement um, for, for better rights in, in access to information, participation and justice and, and the legal fraternity playing a key role. Um, you know, some some very big, powerful points there. Thank you. Coretta, let, let, let me hear from you. What what are the mechanisms you think need to be strengthened in, in, in particular or could be strengthened? I, I believe that there are many things in place, but as Erica pointed out, a lot of people are not aware of them. For example, in St. Lucia, you have the NEIS, that's the National Environmental Information System, where they monitor MEAs, uh, multilateral environmental agreements, um, and people could access this it's on the internet and so on. They're trying to raise awareness, but again, not enough people know about it, not enough people utilize it. Um, Erika made a point about the, the lawyers being aware of this and maybe um, Antigua and Barbuda could try this, but the Department of Sustainable Development earlier this year had a series of workshops. They had it with the Bar Association. I forgot the, the trade union, but they were there and they had one with magistrates and the trust was invited to present, um, particularly me, about the role of civil society in um, enhancing or pushing the Escazo Agreement. So maybe this is what other countries could do. Um, ECLAC was a part of it. Reach out to myself as an elected rep or Daniel would be happy to make a presentation. The more groups you have that are aware aware of it, the more powerful it will be, the more efficient it would be um, and in, in terms of the, the implementation of the agreement. Because if you just have the trust or, or Arika's organization, it's not going to be efficient. You need to get to a wide cross-section of, 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 of um, groups, churches, schools. We've done multiple presentations at schools across the island, really breaking it down so the children could understand in simple terms what Eskazu is, this is important to get to the young people. Um, just to give a point to Arika, um, I agree that the young people are interested, but I, I find in St. Lucia, Eskazu is not high on the priority for them right now, but we do still try to reach out to them. Our membership program assistant, for example, is 20 or 21. So she keeps her ears on the ground. She knows and she has an idea. So she does a lot of Facebook polls to ask, do you know about so-and-so or would you like to? And then based on the results, we tailor our messages, you know, put up videos or an infographic specifically targeting them. And then the older folks, you might do a Facebook live, you know, on a particular issue or write an article. So, you know, you don't have to go and invest in any major survey if you can't afford it right now, because it's hard times, but you could use social media to carry out polls and find out what it is that people would be willing to, to learn about. And then you could tailor your message accordingly. Um, I think, yeah, those are some points. You have to make it easy for people and, and empowering for them yes. to engage. It, it's not enough to say government create mechanisms and people don't step forward exactly. um, so that you know that's such a strong point you made about raising awareness you know of people of this is your right you should engage and this is why and this is how um but I, unless or until we come up with catchy tiktok videos on Escazo agreement <laughs> i have a 20 year old and we're not getting them until we go in on to tiktok um is, is is what i'm told but i don't know how to do a funny TikTok video on Escazo Agreement. So that's yeah. a challenge out for all the participants. Please tell me if you have your ideas. Um, but TikTok, yeah. though, if you just jump in, 
Um, we're in the process of organizing or liaising with, because in St. Lucia, the Denry segment is very popular. I'm not sure if you've heard of the music. I'm, I'm, I've heard some Trinidadians who love it. Um, so the Denry segment, we're trying to liaise with one of the artists to come up with a really catchy, youthful, you know, type of vibe song. And I'm sure it's going to do well. And um, maybe if we word it in such a way so that it's not only speaking to the St. Lucian context, but the Caribbean, who knows, you could share it with other countries and you could utilize this on your social media platform via WhatsApp or on your radio station. So we'll keep you posted to, you know, on how that is going. Fantastic, fantastic. But yeah, the first step really being raising awareness and bringing people in, but in tailored ways that make sense to them. Um, I think really powerful um, points there, both of you. I'm just double checking the Q&A bo box. We have a comment from Bertrand um, Bihari, who's in Tobago, I know, um, works with Environment Tobago, one of our partners as well. Doing a lot of good work on, on participatory environmental management. Um, um, really, Bertrand has some very philosophical ideas about how to approach this. Huh? Um, really seeing that the first sign of good intention is signing on, you know, so we really expect this should be something governments is a no brainer governments to make the commitment saying we believe our citizens have the right to a healthy environment. And therefore, this agreement is something we are interested in pursuing. Um, yes, we may not have full capacity. Yes, we may have a lot to put in place. Yes, you know, it's a journey. Um, I think everyone accepts that and understands that. And we need to be reasonable but come on that journey with us. Um, I think very much is what civil society is asking governments to do. Signal your commitment to these principles. I could jump in. Yeah. So what you just said is important because if we ever wait for everything to be, you know, perfect, it will never be. So as you said, the time is now. So when they, when they sign on and they ratify, it really shows political will. And not only that, the trust is not the only NGO in the Caribbean that's willing to work. Um, there are NGOs all across the Caribbean who are willing to work with the government and we have access to funds, you know, grants that the government can't apply for, but we could apply to them and try to, you know, raise awareness on Eskazu, try to, to um, you know, influence policy, do the research and, and hand this over to them. And so they ought not to look at it as if, you know, I don't have the money or we don't have things in place, but meet with your civil society organizations, work with them, see what, you know, they what proposals they could write, you could contribute to it get the funding and let's get this, you know, thing going. There are millions of dollars out there, you know, for us to 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 really tap into to um, advance Eskazu in our Caribbean countries. A whole of society approach. Um, I love that. Arika, do you have any kind of final wrap-up comments, reflections for us? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I'm just really looking forward to this process. I'm looking forward to seeing, to seeing voices of um, Caribbean nationals really at the center of environment. Um, I think that too long we have been, you know, kind of relegated to the to the back and it's it's always kind of a um, a matter of, you know, where you sit in terms of your demographics, you know, and the the the, the feeling that well it's only the rich have power. I I'm really looking forward to seeing every individual feeling like they have the power to say something. They have the power to access any kind of information and that that information is not just, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I I can look at it but I can really I have a chance to say what happens to it I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing that so fingers crossed that this goes really well fingers crossed and I think we we have to look forward remember to the meeting of signatories in in December and Coretta is one of our representatives of the public who who has a seat around the table, really bringing some of these civil society perspectives into the discussions. And Coretta, you want to remind us, I have it written down, but what that meeting will focus on, some of the things we're looking at in terms of implementation? Well, I don't think any major decisions will be taken at that meeting, but they're going to look at the rules of procedure, for example, um, the funding mechanisms and so on. And Ruth Spencer's on this um, platform. Thanks, Ruth, for attending. Um, as you know, it's in Antigua and Barbuda. I do know that we are working with the Escazoo Youth Champion 
champions. There are about four of them from Latin America and one from the Caribbean, Nafisha Richards. And we have a meeting actually because we want to plan a virtual session. And we're meeting with them for them to tell us what it should look like. This is not something Caretta is going to dictate. We want them to tell us what this should look like. And hopefully with their, you know, push, a lot of youth around the Caribbean will be joining because I believe because of COVID, the meeting will be held predominantly virtually. So it's a perfect opportunity for persons to just join, make the time, learn. And I'm, I'm, I think many persons on this um, Zoom um, call might have already signed up. And I just want to encourage persons who have not yet signed up to the regional public mechanism. It takes three minutes or so to sign up. And when you do that, you're going to get information from ECLAC, that's the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, that's the Secretariat. They're going to send you information about the um, treaty, about the agreement, and how you could participate in the upcoming virtual meeting of the signatory countries. And I'll also like to encourage persons to check out the observatory on principle 10. Um, just, just Google observatory on principle 10, and you can find out more about the countries that have signed, um, what laws they have in place for any of the, the um, tenets of ESPAZU, whether it's information, public participation or justice, so you can become more familiar of what you already have and where the gaps are and how you could, you know, um, enhance your advocacy to encourage your governments to improve in particular areas. Um, and I'm here, my email advocacy at s-l-u-n-a-t-r-u-s-t dot org. Um, reach out to me. I will make the time to make a presentation to simplify it because many of the persons who are part of this are lawyers and, you know, other important professions. Um, but I'm as simple as you go. I'm a communications person. My role is to break it down in simple terms because I don't understand a lot of the, you know, the high legal things, but the simple thing, ESCA Zoo is a people-centered approach to environmental governance. We will get an opportunity at the table and not be left behind. So it makes perfect sense to be a part of it. It makes perfect sense to push it. So I'll stop there for now. You're correct. And you're ready. Hitting home, you know, a message in this chat series, ESCA Zoo is for you. Um, ESCA Zoo is not something for lawyers in a, in a fancy room. It is for you, for me, for us. Um, you know, it is for all those citizens, those local communities, vulnerable groups who are concerned about development, who are concerned about making sure the environment is protected, they have the right to a healthy environment. Get involved and, and the ESCAZO agreement will help you, will support all these mechanisms at the national level um, to make that happen. And so the first step really is this important of engaging and finding out more about the agreement, which we expect to, to enter into force. We expect to get the 11 ratifications very soon. Um, and in, then the agreement will enter into force by early next year. Um, but already it's very encouraging. These countries are starting negotiations on implementation. You know, So I really feel this is so, so powerful and such an opportunity for us. And I want to, to just, and in wrapping up, um, remind people of the countries and where they are. It's all on the website, as, as Coretta said. We have great leadership being shown um, by Antigua and Barbuda, Guyana, St. Vincent and Grenadines, and, and St. Kitts and Nevis. And congrats to all of you. Your governments have really committed to, to environmental rights for your citizens. And I'm very proud. I'm getting little goosebumps. Very, very proud of, of, of these five countries. Looking forward to more, you know, countries which have already signaled that first step of commitment. Belize, Dominica, Grenada, Haiti, Jamaica, Dominican Republic, St. Lucia. Please, um, you've signed wonderful we want you to take that final step and ratify um, so you can really get involved. And the three countries in the region, we're calling on you, signal your commitment. Don't hold back. Don't be afraid. Come on this journey with civil society. We are supporting you. That's Bahamas, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we really want you. You're at the point now that there's, it's never too late to join this party, this wonderful journey. Come on board um, and, and, and accede to the agreement. It's a very exciting time in the region. And Canary, you know, we'll be continuing with this chat series next week. We have two powerful ladies from Jamaica. We're going to be looking at access to justice. On the next, Eskazoo is for you. The previous government went to China a few years ago and announced that there was going to be a port development at the Goat Islands. The Goat Islands are islands within the Portland Bay protected area, which is an area that was agreed by academia, general public, etc., and that was set up in 1998. That activities within that area must fall within um, what is allowable. So you have to go through a certain process for decisions to be made. 
The Ask a Zoo is for You team would like to send a special thanks to our funder, the European Union, for their support of the Ask a Zoo is for You live chat series, this podcast, and the Pisces Project overall. To our special guests, Arika Hill and Coretta Crooks Charles, for lending us their time and expertise on public participation in environmental matters. And to our live viewing and listening audience for their uh, thoughtful commentary and questions on the Eskazoo Agreement and public participation. Thank you.